No, Maras. Okay. So we can begin? Yeah. Yes, Maras. Om, om Ajnana Recording in progress. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanjana Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschatyate Shatarine Vanja Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavi Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Kaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Can I share the screen? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, just, I just want to know it's the uh, voice is cracking in between. It's only for me or for the rest of the class also. I think it's, I think it's for everybody. I, it's crack, I don't know. It's something I have to adjust on my computer. I don't know what's wrong. It's been like this all day. I don't know what's wrong. Can, can you tell me what I need to do? Anybody? Can you help, Maharaj? Yeah, well, just repeat. The uh, Maharaj, why is this cracking in between? Maharaj, this voice is cracking in between. Uh, Maharaj, have you tried just to switch off your computer and switch it back on? I don't know. That generally sometimes works. Really? Well, I, well, I could try. You want to wait for a couple of minutes while I turn off and come back? But Mara, it's it is manageable. It's not disturbing that much. It is manageable. Rest if everybody wants it. I think Mara's voice is clear. Pro uh, to your voice is breaking. Okay, maybe my uh, internet is not on. Yes. Well, I, I know mine. It's been cracking all day. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I think yeah, as part of your probably said, it seems like you're clean, Mara. Okay, I'll go ahead. If it's okay, if you can tolerate. Uh -huh. All right, so we're we're on beginning here, chapter number twenty-four of the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, for, at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav, and we're hearing chapter twenty-four. The title: Renunciation of Kardama Muni. So we heard. At the end of chapter 23, we heard uh, Devahuti <laughs> feeling herself cheated. She was lamenting that she had had the association of a great soul in the form of her husband, Kardama Muni, but she hadn't really taken advantage of her husband's association for her own spiritual benefit. Uh, that was her feeling anyway. And so, the chapter 24 begins uh, with uh, the merciful sage Kardama speaking to Swayambhuvamanu. Spe speaking to Swayambhuvamanu's daughter. <laughs> right? The daughter, of course, is Devahuti. So, she was... Uh, they were they were both recalling the words of Lord Brahma that they'd been they'd promised that they were going to give birth they were going to have a child who was the incarnation of the supreme Lord. So Kardama Muni reminds his good wife about that and tells her, "Don't be disappointed with yourself, O Princess. You are actually praiseworthy, the infallible supreme personality of Godhead." 
will shortly enter your womb as your son. So in this way, Kadama Muni is consoling his wife. There's no reason for her to lament. She was feeling, <laughs> you know, her husband's cheated her, he gave nine daughters, and then he wants to go away and take sannyas. And, however, uh, one more thing is to happen, and that is that Lord Kapila has to appear. So this was the, the important point, which hadn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. Indeed, we will hear in this chapter how Lord Kapila appears. So he appears, his appearance is actually through the simon of Kadama. He takes birth through the womb of Devahuti and he goes on to become. And comforts her that you've undertaken sacred vows, God will bless you, you should worship the Lord with great faith, religious observances, austerities, and gifts of your money in charity. I don't know where she got her money, and maybe, of course, Swain was with him when he left his daughter there in the ashram of Kardama Muni. Anyway, these, this, uh, these are the principles to progress in spiritual life. We have to have this, these kind of qualities. There has to be faith in the Lord. There has to be sense control. You have to be willing to do some austerities. And you have to be willing to sacrifice things like if you have some charity, you have some wealth, you should be willing to give it to the Lord. Ultimately, we have to give everything to the Lord. As, um, Prabhupada, I remember Prabhupada told Prajumna, Prajumna Prabhu was the Sanskrit editor of Srila Prabhupada. He was commonly referred to as Panditji. So Prajumna Prabhu told me how Prabhupada had told him that he said, fasting is necessary for spiritual life. So that idea, the principle is control. There has to be self-control. You must follow rules and regulations. There has to be some austerity. And we have to be willing to give up the opulences which we possess. We have to be willing to let go of all these things which are entanglements in the material world which keep us attached to the body. We have to be willing to really take shelter of the Supreme Lord. So like that, Kardama Muni is telling his wife that she has to really submit herself, she has to give up and take shelter of the Lord. And then he goes on telling her, text number four, the personality of Godhead being worshipped by you will spread my name and fame. He will vanquish the knot of your heart by becoming your son and teaching knowledge of Brahman. So Kadama Muni is appreciating that when the Lord comes as the son of Devahuti, it will also help the name of Kadama Muni because he's the father. He's going to, as she's going to be the mother, he will be the father. So it's a great credit to have a child who's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Kardama Muni and Devahuti are known like that as the parents of Lord Kapila. And then he tells her, he talks to Devahuti about the knot in the heart. So that knot in the heart that identification with the material world, thinking of ourself as the body, what is called in Sanskrit the Rudaya Granti, Granti the knot and Rida in the heart. So this knot in the heart is there in all conditioned souls and it becomes more and more tight when there is too much affection for, or too much a, a, affection or attract attachment to sex life. So that has to be cut, that kind of attachment, that attachment to enjoying the pleasure of the material body. We have to be willing to give that up. That attraction between the opposite makes that not very strong. When Lord Kapila comes, he's going to give spiritual knowledge to cut that knot of material attachment. That is, of course, the Sankhya attachment to the material world.
So then Maitreya is continuing, Maitreya is speaking, she was very faithful and respectful, argue with her husband. She accepted what he said. And uh, of course Kardama, he's one of the Prajapatis, he's supposed to generate the human beings, to populate the universe. It's a great satisfaction to, for them to know that the Supreme Lord is going to come as their child. The guru of his wife, and Prabhupada writes in the purport, there are many instances where the husband, Maiva, he's the spiritual master of his wife, Parvati. Right? We know uh, Lord Shiva told his wife many important instructions. For example, he told her, chant the holy name of Lord Ram, the holy name of Lord Rama, one, that 1,000 names of Vishnu is equal to one name of Ra Lord Rama. And he also told his wife that of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu is supreme, and even greater than the worship of Vishnu is the worship of those things in relationship to Vishnu. So can you think of some other examples where the husband becomes the guru of his wife and gives instruction? Anyone? You know some examples from scripture? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I couldn't understand that, Prabhu. It wasn't clear. Uh, he says uh, that um, um, uh, Aditi, Aditi and uh, her husband, uh, Kasyapa. Kasyapa also um, like a guru here to advise me, uh, Aditi. That's like uh, common them. Okay. Why, brother? Yeah. Okay, Kashyapa and Aditi. Yes, uh, And the, 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 of course, they, who did they get as their son? Lord Vamanadev. Yeah, Lord yes, Vamanadev, right. Lord Vamanadev yes. came as their child. So they were very blessed. Right? Yeah, and any other examples where the husband is the guru of his wife? Then, you know, it's not always that you have to leave your wife. You know, many times the husband can stay with the wife and, and the, the wife can be properly guided through the, associate, through the husband. Whereas, Pastor Pamani has 13 wives. So, like that, he also advised to get the and uh, uh, that's, you know, the wives, the so, so they're all like his disciples, eh? Yeah. Okay. We see Bhaktivinoda Thakur, for example, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he never took sannyas. He stayed stayed with his family, he had his, his wife, she was a, de, a good devotee, Bhagavati, and her, the, those deities, actually Gorgadar, her deities, which are there at the Yoga Peeth in Mayapur, it said they were worshipped by Bhaktivinoda Thakur's wife. After she disappeared, then the deities were brought to the Yoga Peeth and worshipped there. Lord, so can I just ask in this connection, so generally speaking, because we see in India generally um, at the main temples, like I don't know, public temples that spread like that, um, we generally don't see women like on the altar, but for home deities it's a different thing altogether, right? For home deities, yes, it's much different, right? And at home, yeah, we would generally, the woman, the woman would maybe do the deity worship at home, but in public temples, yes, it's a tradition, you know. And of course, at home, the woman, if she's contaminated, then she won't do the deity worship, even though the deity is at home. 
She'll observe the principles of purity, cleanliness. So if she's in her monthly cycle, she will she will not she will not do the worship, and the worship would be done by the husband at that time. But other times she would be doing the deity, worshiping the deities. Yes. Sorry? Bhakti Thakur and Bhagavati, Bhakti that first time? Yes, that was his second wife. First wife died, the second wife was Bhagavati. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. So, Maharaj, in America, in the US, we see that um, even uh, sometimes, even women are actually worshipping the worship in the depth. Yes, yes. In, outside of India, yeah, we're not so conservative. And uh, but the women also go on the altar and do worship there, right. It's just, yeah, even some temples in India, there are temples in India where women also go on the altar. You know, here in Mayapur, of course, in Mayapur and Vrindavan, like that, then because they're very prominent temples, so that and because there's a lot of men, the women don't go on the altar. But the women do do a lot of service, like the flower arrangements and the garland making and the dresses, and sometimes they even help dressing the deities. But they don't actually do the pujas and the public artists, right? But there are temples. There are temples in the city where the women do it. You know. In Calcutta, I know in the Albert Road Temple, it used to be women were doing the puja there in Prabhupada's time. I was there in the 1970s and Prabhupada would come and Narayani was there and she was worshipping the deity. And Prabhupada didn't mind at all. He encouraged. Yeah, women were doing very nice service. But in other temples where you have a lot of men, more men, so the men do it. Yeah, if there's sufficient manpower, there's no need for the women to go on the altar. Mm -hmm. So husbands, be, the husband, while he, 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 you know, he's also expected to take care of his wife, he's not only materially, he's also expected to give her spiritual guidance. And we do see that happening. But in that pur in this purport here, Prabhupada does speak about, he said, the, uh, the husband should be enlightened. Then he can become the spiritual master of his wife. If he, you know, he's going to guide her spirit, he has to be enlightened. He shouldn't be overly attached and enamored to the opposite sex. So, the woman generally is considered less intelligent than the man, and if the man is intelligent enough, the woman gets a great opportunity for spiritual enlightenment. So that combination, the man and the woman, when they, when they can work together nicely, then it's very, it can be very helpful for spiritual advancement. And we're seeing here, Kadama Muni and Devahuti, that, you know, they made advancement. They made great advancement. And ultimately, of course, they separate. They come together for some time and they enjoy their householder life. And then later on, you know, they're ready to detach. Of course, it's, it's, it's a challenge, it's not so easy, but they understand it's their duty, it's according to Shastra. He's, a, he's as a great Brahmana, he can go on and take sannyas. The Kshatriya kings, those Kshatriya kings, they didn't take sannyas, they would take Vanaprastha, and often their wife would go with them into the forest as vanaprastas. There was no need for them to separate. The wife would follow the husband, just like Gandhari followed Dhritarashtra to the forest. 
But Kadama Muni is a Brahmana, so he's going to take sannyas, he's going to go away from home. And he's, left, he's going to leave his wife with a son. So that's the important point, that Devahuti won't be alone, she's going to have her son there. So text number six continues. After many, many years, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Madhusudan, the killer of the demon Madhu, having entered the semen of Kardama, appeared in Devahuti, just as fire comes from wood in a sacrifice. So the, the example is given there, how the Lord appears. He can, the Lord can appear any, any number of ways. Prabhupada writes in the purple here, uh, this manifests his full independence to act in any way. And it does not mean that he is an ordinary living entity forced to take birth in a certain type of womb. Lord Nishringadev appeared from the pillar of Haranyakashipu's palace. Lord Varaha appeared from the nostril of Brahma. And Lord Kapila appeared from the semen of Kardama. But this does not mean that the nostril of Brahma or the pillar of Haranyakashipu's palace or the semen of Kardama Muni is the source of the appearance of the Lord. The Lord is always the Lord. <laughs> He's the killer of the demons, he remains the Lord even if he appears as the son of a particular devotee. Of course, this is, this is very difficult for non-devotees to understand. How can they imagine that the Lord can be someone's son, that he's supposed to be God, he's the father of everyone, but he's coming as someone's child? I, I think maybe I told you before, I was distributing books in Europe one time, and this man told me, he said, I, I know Krishna cannot be God. He takes birth. He has a father and mother. But Shiva, he's God. He is light. <laughs> so that was uh, his Mayavadi understanding. Anyway, people think like that. So we have to understand the nature of the Lord and how he can appear from any place. He's everywhere. So, yeah, he can be everywhere. He can be also in the semen of Kardama Muni. He can be in the womb of Devahuti. He's everywhere. So when the Lord appears, Lord Kapila is appearing there. So text number seven goes on to describe how all the residents in the higher planets, the demigods and the Kandavas, the Apsaras, they're all in rejoicing because they understand the Lord is appearing. In the time of the Lord's appearance, the demigods, they're, they're showering flowers. All the directions were very satisfied. And Lord Brahma, he went along with Marichi and other sages to the palace of Kardama Muni's her her hermitage. So you can see, just like Lord Krishna, when Lord Krishna appeared in the womb of Devaki, the demigods were all going to the prison house of Kamsa and they were offering prayers to the Lord in the womb of Devaki. So here you have the Lord in the womb of Devahuti and they've all come to Kardama's hermitage. Lord Brahma and other different demigods, they're all coming and they're going to offer their prayers and glorify the Lord. And it's, it's mentioned how Lord Brahma, he could understand that the personality of God had, had appeared in the womb of Devahuti. And Lord Brahma also knew the purpose of the Lord's appearance, that he was going to give this knowledge of the Sankhya Yoga. He was going to teach the Sankhya Yoga philosophy to free people from their attachment to this material world. So how did Brahma know? Well, Lord Brahma is, remember, he's the original person in the universe. He's Adikavaye, 
And how did he know the Vedas? The, the Vedic knowledge was put into the heart of Brahma. In the same way, Brahma acquired knowledge from the Supreme Lord, and he understood about the appearance of Kardama. Brahma gets knowledge directly from the Lord. All right, the disciplic succession comes from Brahma. Brahma is the Adi Guru. So the Lord instructed this knowledge directly into his heart. So Prabhupada said, Lord Brahma is sometimes called Swarat and Aja. Swarat meaning independent and Aja meaning unborn. Now, of course, the birth of Brahma is not ordinary. So when the Lord comes, he expands either as a Kala or as Amsha. Amsha means the direct expansion and Kala means expansion of the expansion. There's no difference between the expansion and the expansion of the expansion. And there's no difference between them and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Prabhupada gives, he quotes like Brahma Samhita, the example about one candle can light many other candles, but the heat and light in each candle will be the same. So Lord Brahma comes there to the hermitage of Kardama Muni and he, he's... Uh, worshipping the Supreme Lord and he's come to encourage and speak to Kardama Muni and Devahuti. So we're going to hear what Brahma has to say to the Lord. It begins text number 12. First, well, first he's speaking to Kardama and Devahuti because Kardama is, is, is his son and Lord Brahma had asked Kardama Muni, remember, to populate the universe. So Lord Brahma is very pleased with Kardama and he, he glorifies him. You, you completely accepted my instructions without duplicity, showing them proper respect. You have worshipped me properly. Whatever instructions you took from me, you have carried out. Thereby, you have honoured me. So in this way, Kardama Muni is a great example for us in how we should follow the orders of the spiritual master without any deviation, without any uh, imperfection. Being faithful to the order of the Guru, very important quality. So Lord Brahma is appreciating that. Remember, of course, the four Kumaras were a little different. Lord Brahma had asked them, but they, did, they couldn't do it, they didn't want to do it. Anyway, Lord Brahma accepted that because, you know, they had the higher purpose in mind. And of course, Narada Muni, he's also Brahmachari, he's not going to marry. He was also a son of Brahma. But Kadama Muni, he did marry, he did accept the wife, and they had, yeah, they had the children. So text 13 describes the, Jew, the, sons, the sons ought to render service to their father. One should obey the father or spiritual master with due deference saying, yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> we should do whatever we're told without any argument. And Prabhupada said, the disciples, the, if the disciple said, this is not correct, I cannot do it, I cannot carry it out. So when he says that, then he has fallen. So it's not, you're not disciple anymore, you're fallen. If you cannot carry out the order of the spiritual master, very important to have that faith and the determination to execute the order of the spiritual master. Just at the end of the purport of text 13, Prabhupada has made an important point for us which I want to bring to your attention. He says, one may be materially considered an, an illiterate man, 
But if he has faith in the spiritual master, as well as in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then the meaning of scriptural revelation is immediately manifested before him. So that is similar to the verse in the scripture, Yashya Devi para Bhaktir Yata Devi Tata Guru, that you have equal faith in both God and in Guru, and then everything is revealed. The instructions of the scriptures are revealed. So Lord Brahma is very pleased with Kadama. One of the reasons why he was pleased was because he had produced nine daughters. And so text 14 goes on to describe, All your thin-waisted daughters are certainly very chaste. I am sure they will increase this creation by their own descendants in various ways. So, Lord Brahma also, he's making arrangements for these girls to get married. He said, today, please give away your daughters to the foremost of the sages. <laughs> the foremost of the sages are the sons of Brahma. So, there's nine sons of Brahma who want to, who need a wife. So, the nine, wife, the nine daughters of Kadama, they're going to be given to the nine sages. In the purport, Prabhupada said, the daughters should be handed over to the respective rishis, not blindly, but according to the combination of character and taste. This is the art of combining a man and woman. Man and woman should not be united simply on consideration of sex life. There are many other considerations, especially character and taste. So this, this is very important. We spoke about this before also, the importance of the taste. You know, if, if the woman is a, a, of a Brahminical nature and the man is a, of a Sudra nature, then the combination would be very bad. Or if the woman is a Vaishya and the man is a Brahman, then it would be very difficult. So Prabhupada talks about the astrology that it can help people. <laughs> Prabhupada said, a girl of demonic quality should be handed over to a boy of demonic quality. Then they will be happy. But if the girl is demoniac and the boy is godly, then the combination will be, is incompatible. They cannot be happy in such a marriage. Okay, so then uh, Lord Brahma is speaking, speaks to Kadama. I know that the, in, the I, O Kadama, I know that the supre, original Supreme Personality of Godhead has now appeared as an incarnation by his internal energy. He is the bestower of all that is desired by the living entities and he has now assumed the body of Kapila Muni. So Lord Brahma is aware that Lord Kapila has appeared in this world. And Lord Kapila, uh, Lord Brahma rather, continues to describe Lord Kapila. And he talks about his appearance, golden hair, eyes like lotus petals, lotus feet, marks of the lotus flowers on his lotus feet, like that. So he, Lord Brahma is aware of the, the appearance of Kapila Muni. And Kapila Muni has come to give this, this knowledge of Sankhya. And Prabhupada talks about this knowledge. He said, Gyan means knowledge received through the disciplic succession from the scriptures. And Vigyan means practical application of such knowledge. Kapila Muni Sankhya system of philosophy is based on both Gyan and Vigyan, right? Both knowledge and 
practical application, you could call realization. Sometimes we say vijnana is realization. Here Prabhupada describes it as practical application of the knowledge. And so this is actually religion. You can see sanatana dharma. We have knowledge and religion. Religion is applying that knowledge. When we talk about the religious process, it's the application of that knowledge. So Lord Brahma is now speak next verse 18, Lord Brahma speaks to Devahuti and he tells her that uh, the child who is now within your womb that he's the personality of Godhead and he killed the demon Kaitaba and he will cut off all the knots of your ignorance and doubt and then he will travel all over the world. So you can see Lord Brahma's omniscient, he knows the future, he knows that Lord Kapila after he gives his mother the knowledge of Sankhya philosophy then he's going to travel around the world, over the world. Lord Brahma encourages Devahuti, tells her about her son, that your son will be the head of all the perfected souls. He will be approved by the Acharyas, expert in disseminating real knowledge, and among the people he will be celebrated by the name Kapila. As the son of Devahuti, he will increase your fame. You can see Lord Brahma is encouraging Devahuti that you're so fortunate, such a great son. And Lord Brahma is also telling Devahuti the name of her child. <laughs> so she's really blessed. So after speaking to Kadama Muni and his wife Devahuti, Lord Brahma went back to his planetary system. He went back to the, his own abode on his swan carrier and he went back with the four Kumaras and Narada. So along with Lord Brahma, when he'd come there, the four Kumaras and Narada and Muni had come and also the, the nine sages had come as well. So the four Kumaras and Narada Muni, they're brahmacharis. They're not going to get married. They're Naistika Brahmacharis. So they didn't stay. They didn't stay for the marriage. They left. And they went back with Lord Brahma to the uh, Brahmaloka. So after the departure, then Kardama Muni arranges to hand over his daughters to the nine great sages. And we hear. Who gets who? It's all arranged according to their character and taste. And so Kardama Muni knows the characters and he, he, he must know also these other sons of Brahma because Kardama Muni is also one of Brahma's sons. So Kardama Muni is aware of his brother's natures and according to their particular taste and character he knows which daughter will be suitable for which sage. So it's all described there, who gets who. He got the foremost brahmanas married and he maintained them along with their wives. And thus married, the sages took leave of Kardama and departed, full of joy, each for his own hermitage. So just like Kardama Muni lived with Devahuti in his hermitage, so these nine sages, they also have their hermitage and they took their wife with them to go and live in their hermitage. So Kardama Muni wants to approach Lord Vishnu, or Lord Kapila, Well, here it's mentioned Vishnu. Kadama Muni understood the personality of Godhead. The chief of all the demigods, Vishnu, had descended. So he'd come in the form of 
Lord Kapila. Here, Prabhupada talks about Vishnu being Tri Yuga, Tri Yuga, and that he doesn't come in the Kali Yuga. And Lord Chaitanya, of course, comes in the Kali Yuga, but Lord Chaitanya is a covered incarnation. He doesn't reveal himself as the Lord. Maharaj? Yes? Uh, Maharaj, Lord Kalki also comes in Kali Yuga. Yes? So, how Krishna is said to be three yogi? Yes, but what that's talking, you see, that's discussed with uh, Lord Chaitanya when he dis not Lord Chaitanya, but Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya when he discussed with Gopinath Acharya. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was saying Lord Chaitanya could not be the Lord because the Lord does not come in Kali Yuga. But Gopinath Acharya chastised Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and said, No, the Lord comes in every Yuga. Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. He doesn't, he doesn't come in the, in the Kali Yuga, that tree Yuga, that's a special type of incarnation. But the Lord comes in every Yuga, in every Yuga, there's Yuga Avatar. And the Yuga Avatar is described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, right? That the Lord comes in the Kali, the Lord does come in the Kali Yuga. So Gopinath Acharya chastai Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, that you don't know the philosophy. The Lord says, Sambhavami Yuge Yuge, he comes in every age. But he doesn't come as some kind of uh, Leela avatar. The Leela avatar may not be there in the Kali Yuga. But you see what you've got, Kalki avatar, that's, a, that's, that's not really Leela avatar. And Lord Chaitanya comes in Kali Yuga. Lord Chaitanya is a Yuga avatar. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so... Uh, may I ask one more thing, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, what are the three avatars specifically mentioned here? Because there are so many avatars of Krishna. Krishna. What are the three avatars? Uh, which makes him three yugi. Oh, three yugi. Well, three yugi in the sense that he appears in three yugas in Satya Yuga, Treta and Dwapara Yuga, right? Uh, uh, because this color is also mentioned uh, somewhere that in Satya Yuga he was, I think, white color and in Treta... But that's a Yuga red. avatars. That's a Yuga avatars. Yes. The Yuga avatar, the white color. It's mentioned, in, it's mentioned in the 11th canto, there's a conversation, uh, Karabhajana Muni, is instructing Nimi, Nimiraj. Nimiraj is a king, so he wanted spiritual knowledge. And Karabhajana Muni is one of the nine pra, nine prajet, prajetas, huh? the, the nine prajetas, the sons of Rishabdev, and the nine sons of Lord Rishabdev. They they're great Bhagavat devotees. They travel everywhere and preach. So Karabhajana Muni, he told. Nimiraj about the Lord's incarnation in each age. And he described in the Satya Yuga how the Lord comes and he comes in a white color and how he's dressed and he's dressed in a deer skin and he's going to do meditation and he mentions different names by which he's known. Names like Satya and Hamsa and like that. There are different names mentioned there in the 11th canto. And then he mentions also about uh, Treta Yuga and Treta Yuga the Lord comes and he's going to do uh, Yagya and he has all the implements for, for, for performing Yagya and one of his names is actually Yagya <laughs> and uh, then in the, in the uh, Dwapara Yuga the Lord comes at the end of Dwapara Yuga to teach deity worship comes at the end of the Dwapara Yuga. In the form of Maharaj. In the form of Vasudev Krishna. Vasudev Krishna. He should, as Vasudev Krishna, he is worshipped by all the devotees. It's the same Krishna himself, is Dwarka Krishna. Yes, is it, 
Dwarka Krishna, Vasudev Krishna. Yes, teach him. Thank you. And then, of course, the Kali Yuga, you have Krishna Varnam, Tavisha Krishna, Sangoparista Parshadam, Yagnae, Sankirtan Prae, Yajantihi Sumedasaha. In the Kali Yuga, the Lord will come and his color is Akrishna. His color is not blackish, right? So that's in the Kali Yuga, the Lord comes. His color is not blackish, but he is engaged in Krishna Varna. His occupation is engaged in relation to Krishna, in chanting the holy name, in performing Sankirtan, like that. So this is there about the Lord's incarnation, the Yuga Avatar. Yes, 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 Maharaj. So white color is maybe Vaman Dev and red is Lord Ram, Yuga Avataras, Maharaj. Is it so? Sorry? The white color Vaman Dev for Satyuga and red color Treta Yuga, Lord Ram. No, no, and... no, no, no. Lord Rama is Lila Avatar. Okay, so uh, I didn't know for what uh, the colors are mentioned Lord, for three yugas. And Lord Vamana Dev is also Leela Avatar. Uh -huh. uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, the Lord who appeared before uh, Kartamuni, he is that person in white color that is mentioned in Chaitanya The Lord who appeared where? Before, in, before uh, Kartamuni. Oh, the Lord who appeared to Kardama yeah. Muni when Kardama yeah. Muni was doing his. I was there austerity. The Lord Vishnu appeared to him? Yeah, that is in white color. Respected. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is that mentioned there, is it? Yes, Maharaj, in Chaitanya Charitamrita. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita? Yes. It's mentioned that he's the Yuga avatar for Satya Yuga? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Anyway, he what did he do? He just he came to Kardama Muni and he told him that, okay, your wife is coming. You, this girl was coming. She'll make you a good wife. You should accept her. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, Maharaj, uh, I've heard that in the Srimad Bhagavatam, seven canto, it is said that the red is Vishnu I'm sorry. White is. White is Lord Kapila and red is Lord Krishna Garba. I'm sorry, I'm not able to understand your voice. What is it? What she saying? Somebody else can understand? Yes, Maharaj. She's saying that red color incarnation of the Lord is for Krishna Garba. Oh, for Krishna Garba. Okay. Krishna Garba, that's. Uh, uh, Prishni Garba, Prishni and Sutapa, when they did their austerities. So yes, they, they got the Lord as their son, right? Well, they got the benediction that they would have the Prishni Garba. Prishni and Sutapa performed austerities in this, in the, long ago. Maybe it was in Satya Yuga, I'm not sure. But Prishni Garba appeared to them as their son. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. It is uh, Treta Yuga. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is mentioned. Oh, Krishna Garba came in Treta Yuga. That's Treta Yuga. Okay. In Treta Yuga. And then, then that, that, the second time, then they got the Lord as Vamana Deva as their son. Because Prish, <coughs> Krishna and Sutapa, they became Kashyapa and Aditi. Right? The first. The first the, they got the Lord, they got the blessing, the Lord would come as their child three times. So the first one was as Prishni and Sutapa, and then the second time was Kashyapa and Aditi, when Lord Vamanadev came. And then the third time is Vasudev and Devaki. Okay, anyway, here we have uh, Kadama Muni. He understood that the Lord has come as his child, and so Kardama Muni wants to 
offer prayers and offer his obeisances. And he has approached him, mentioned in a secluded place. He's come before the Lord and he wants to offer prayers to him. And so that begins in text number 27. Kardama is speaking to the Lord and he says, After a long time, the demigods of this universe have become pleased with the suffering souls who are in materialistic entanglement because of their own misdeeds. <laughs> so, understand, after a long time, the demigods have become pleased with the suffering souls. And the souls are suffering, why? Because of their own misdeeds. Because of our own activities, we're, we're suffering. We cannot blame others for our suffering. It's all our own fault. And so that is described in the, in the Bhagavad Gita also. Although here, Prabhupada does talk about the forest fire, and he says the forest fire takes place on its own. Nobody's to blame. It's just nature. And so we may think like that. We may think, oh, it's, it's not really my fault. It, it just happened. Hmm. Okay, so where are we? Ah. So when the demigods became distressed by the suffering of the conditioned souls, they approached the Lord to remedy the suffering and the Personality of Godhead descends. We know from the beginning uh, in the tenth canto how the demigods all went to, well, the demigods, first of all, Mother Earth, Bhumi, she goes to, with the other demigods, they go to see Lord Brahma, and they appeal to Lord Brahma. And then Lord Brahma takes all the demigods and they go to the shore of the milk ocean and they pray to the Lord and sway to dweep. And they pray to the Lord to sway to dweep that the earth is overburdened by so many demoniac kings and they want the Lord to come. And at that time the Lord told them all, if you go and take your birth in the family of the Yadu dynasty, then I'm also coming there soon. So like that, the Lord comes to the material world to alleviate the distress of the demigods who are suffering because of all the miscreants like all the demonic kings who were overburdening the planet Earth. That's one reason for the Lord coming. Well, there are other reasons. Just like there, there's also the schedule which the Lord has. He has his own schedule for coming. Generally, the Lord who comes in every Divya Yuga, he's coming from Mahavishnu, from Sweta Dweep. Oh, not Mahavishnu, but from Svetadweep, which is the planet where Shirodakashai Vishnu resides. But once in the day of Brahma, once in the day of Brahma, the Supreme Personality of Godhead comes. When, and at that time, when the Supreme Personality of Godhead comes, then all the incarnations of Vishnu, they're all there within the body of the Supreme Lord. In the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, it describes about uh, the demigods going to Sweta Dweep. They ask, why didn't they just simply go to Brahmaloka? Because the Mahapurusha is also residing there on Satyaloka, on the planet of Lord Brahma. Mahapurusha resides there, and Mahapurusha is also the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the the personality of Godhead is there, he's in Sweta Dweep and he's also in Satyaloka. Why didn't they just go to Brahmaloka, Satyaloka, and ask the Lord there? But the Lord in Satyaloka, they were worried maybe he's taking rest, because after they do the yagya, he takes rest. And also they worried that maybe if he left them, they, you know, they would be without the association of the Lord. So they don't like the Lord to leave them. So they went to the Lord of Sweta Dweep and they played, prayed to the Lord, the Lord of Sweta Dweep, namely Shirodakashai Vishnu. 
But you see, within the universe, the Lord is there. He's in, he's in Sweta Dweep. He's also in Satyaloka. But different forms. It's the Mahapurusha on Satyaloka and it's Shirodakashayu Vishnu in Sweta Dweep. Then text 28. After many births, mature yogis, by complete trance in yoga, endeavor in secluded places to see the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Kadama Muni is describing the perfection of yoga. Kadama Muni is a great yogi. He knows the goal of yoga. So he's describing himself to the Lord, the real purpose of yoga. The, you, we, we want to actually see the Lord. Not just feel Him, but actually see the Lord. And not just only see him, but take part in his activities and be engaged in his loving service. That is the real perfection of yoga. So, of course, to do that, we have to fully surrender ourselves, And then the Lord being pleased with us, he can take us into his association. So Kadama Muni continues to offer his prayers. He says in text 29, Not considering the negligence of ordinary householders like us, that very same Supreme Personality of Godhead appears in our home just to support his devotees. So when the Lord comes in this world, Generally, he will come in the home of his devotees. Just like he came as the child of Vasudeva and Devaki, or he came as the child of Nanda and Yashoda, or the child of Jagannath Mishra and Sachimata. So the Lord comes in the family of devotees. The Lord can choose where he will take his birth about. We, we're not able to choose. We, are, we were forced. We we're placed into different situations. Karmana daiva netrena jantor deho papadi. Right? According to our karma and the will of the Supreme Lord, we're placed into different conditions of life. Someone becomes a child in a devotee family and somebody's put into a family of gross materialists. It's not by chance. It's all under the control of the Supreme Lord. So the devotee is so fortunate, he gets the opportunity to actually associate with the Lord face to face. When the Lord comes in this world, devotees like Vasudeva and Devaki, and uh, here it's uh, Kardama Muni and Devahuti, they're actually face to face with the Lord. So Kadama Muni, he's speaking to the Lord, who is his actual son, but he can understand that while the Lord has come as his son, he's also the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Kadama Muni goes on to glorify the Lord in his prayers. He said, you, are, you always increase the honor of your devotees. You have descended in my home just to fulfill your word and disseminate the process of real knowledge. Lord Brahma had given, he told Devahuti that the Lord is going to come. And the Lord had told Brahma that, that I will come in the family of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. So Lord Brahma knew and Lord Brahma told Devahuti that this child you're going to give birth to is the Supreme Lord. It's going to come into your womb. You're so fortunate. And Kardama Muni is also fortunate because he's the father and he's the one who is responsible for giving birth to the Lord. So Kardama Muni is offering his prayers to Lord Kapila. And he describes to him, he said, you have no material form. You have your own innumerable forms. They truly are your transcendental forms which are pleasing to your devotee. 
So Prabhupada talks about the Lord's different forms in his purport. We know there are many different forms of the Lord. And generally, of course, we worship Lord Krishna, the two-armed form, but there's other, some people worship the Lord as Narsimha, and we have, of course, here in Mayapur also Narsingadev, and we have Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with the Panchatattva, and sometimes on the appearance day of Lord Varaha, we will bring out the Varaha, Lord Varaha deity, and next month it will be Nishinga Chatodasi, we'll be worshipping Lord Nishinga Dev. Last month we worshipped Lord Rama. So, so many different forms are there of the Lord. In the month of Kartik we worship the Lord as Damodara. Many different pastimes and the Lord takes a name according to the different pastimes. So the Lord has no material form, but he has a form. But his form is not like our form. His form is spiritual. An ordinary person. So this is Vishnu Tattva said there are, but they are all Vishnu Tattva. And then Prabhupada said Krishna. <laughs> They're all Krishna. So you can see Kardama Muni is really a great sage. He's not just simply a, you know, sent, sent, sentimental Hatha yogi, but he actually has very deep knowledge and realization. that. And he's able to offer feeling prayers to Lord Kapiladev. Text 32, he says, Your lotus feet are the reservoir that always deserves to receive worshipful homage from all great sages, either eager to understand the Absolute Truth. You are full in opulence, renunciation, transcendental fame, knowledge, strength and beauty. Therefore I surrender myself unto your lotus feet." So Kadama Muni is very uh, advanced devotee and he's offering his prayers, he wants to, surrendering himself to the Lord, taking advantage of the appearance of the Lord to come before him and offer him, offer, surrender himself fully to his lotus feet. Oh, and then Kadama Muni continues like that, text 33, he says, I surrender unto the Supreme Person, who is the Supreme Person, the Lord of the sum total of matter and the element of time, and being what happens after the comes about, how the material manifestation is absorbed into the body of Mahavishnu. Very philosophical, and he he understands the nature of the Lord's birth, right? Uh, that the one who knows the nature of my birth and activities, then upon giving up this Tarvadiham Punarjanma, Naiti Mamiti Sorjuna. Janma Karma Chame Deviam, Evam Yoveti Takvataha, Tarvadiham Punarjanma, Naiti Mamiti Sorjuna. One who understands the transcendental nature of the Lord's birth and activities, then upon giving up this body, they will never take birth again in the material world. Kardama Muni, is by his prayers, he's showing how he has understood the transcendental nature of the Lord's birth and appearance and activities in this world. He understands the Lord is actually Purusham. He is the enjoyer, the original person. Everyone else is his servants. And the Lord has inconceivable potencies. Prabhupada quotes the verse, Parashya Shakti Vividaiva that his energies are inconceivable. And with his energy, he is able to arrange for the creation the maintenance 
and the ultimate destruction of the material manifestation. It, it all goes on under his direction. So although Kap Kapila Muni is the Supreme Lord, he has come as the son of Kardama Muni. And Kardama Muni has <laughs> come to offer respects to his son. And just like when Lord Ramachandra came, he came as the son of Maharaj Dasarath, so he was always very respectful to his father, Maharaj Dasarath. And we see Lord Krishna as the son of Nanda Maharaj, carrying the shoes of Nanda Maharaj on his head, and then later on releasing Vasudeva and Devaki from the prison house of Kamsa, and the Lord is bowing to them and offering respects. And when Lord Krishna would marry his mother and father, Vasudeva and Devaki would be there. Lord Krishna would arrange for them to be there at his marriage. But ordinary people, common people, they have great difficulty to understand the activities of Lord Krishna. It's, it's very confidential the pastimes of Krishna. Ordinary people, they just become bewildered. They cannot understand. What? How is it? Hmm. But Srila Prabhupada, out of his supreme compassion and mercy, he compiled the Krishna book and he allowed everyone to have the opportunity to hear about the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Those people who are fortunate, they will become attracted. And other people, the fools and rascals, then they will reject. So everyone, according to their own nature, they sow their own seeds of progress or destruction. So text 34, Kadama says to the Lord, he says, Today I have something to ask from you who are the Lord of all living entities. So this is the system, when we offer prayers to the Lord, then we come before the Lord, we should not immediately tell Him what we want. <laughs> Even if you go to see life members, you know, and when we used to go and see life members, and, and I used to be in Calcutta, and we'd have to go to different life members and meet them and talk to them and try to get their support for our Krishna Consciousness Movement. So the, the custom was, you know, you had to speak to them and, and praise them and glorify them and tell them about Krishna Consciousness and so on. And then you ask them, you know, can you do this, we're doing this, we need your help for this. And, you know, you, you cannot just simply go there and tell them what you want. I want this, can you do that for us, you know, we need your check, you know. If you do that, they throw you out. <laughs> but if you spend time with them and flatter them and tell them everything about our Krishna Consciousness Movement and inspire them and encourage them, and then ask them, then they're very nice. And so even children know this art. The children will come to the mother and father, they'll come to the mother, Oh, mother, you're so nice to me, you're such a great mother. Oh, I love you so much. Will you buy me some new shoes? <laughs> I want a new coat. I want a new dress. Like that, the child knows. In the same way, the devotee, in approaching the Lord, you don't immediately ask for what you want. So Kardama Muni offered his prayers of glorifying the Lord. And then he says, I do need, I want to ask you for something. So what does he want? He says, I have now been liberated by you from my debts to my father. And since all my desires are fulfilled, I wish to accept the order of an itinerant mendicant. Renouncing family life, I wish to wander about free from lamentation, thinking always of you in my heart. So this is Kadama Muni's desire. He wants to get out from the home. 
So it's unusual, certainly unusual that the father comes to the son and asks the son, you know, give me your blessings that I can leave home. Can you think of any other examples like that? Other great souls, how did they leave home? Do you know the history, other great souls leaving home? How did they do it? We know, of course, like Dhritarashtra, when he left home, he didn't tell anybody, he didn't ask anyone's permission. But he was guided by Vidura. Uh, Parikit Maharaj left his kingdom. And similarly, um, Bharat Maharaj also left his kingdom. Did they get permission? Did they ask anybody? Uh, I don't think so. Perhaps. Did Lord Chaitanya get permission? Did he ask anyone? <laughs> he obtained permission from his mother. Yes. Yeah, he told her. She could understand. She knew. Lord Chaitanya did tell some people, he arranged for some of them to go with him or to be there. Who did he tell? Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu, yes. Who? Vishnu Priya Devi. No, and then he told his mother also. Did he tell Vishnu Priya he's going to leave home? Actually, he didn't tell, but Vishnu Priya Devi came to know. She came to know? Yes, before the Lord left, he came to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ramanujacharya, how he left home? Do you know? Uh, his wife to uh, in-laws house. He sent his wife to his, to her mother's house, right? To, yes. his, to her yes. father's house. Yes. Sent her back home. <laughs> Trick, yes. Tricked her, right? Yes. He tricked her. Told her, your father wants you urgent, you have to go immediately. And she went there. And when she went there, then he went there. He went away to take sannyas. So that was Ramanujacharya, and then uh, what about Srila Prabhupada? Srila Prabhupada writes, there's one purport, that great souls cheat for a great cause. So Prabhu, Prabhupada said to his wife something like, do you want tea or do you want me? And so his wife said, tea or you? She said, I'd rather have tea. <laughs> you know, the Prabhupada told devotees like this. Uh, Prabhupada said, his wife said, I would rather have tea than you. And so that was it. So Prabhupada thought, okay, then I'm leaving. And he left. And he went to Vrindavan. He didn't immediately take sannyas, but he got out of the house. He detached himself from the home, from the family affairs, and then later on he became sannyasi. Hmm. All right, so renouncing family life. Uh, Kodama wants to wander about, <laughs> free from lamentation and thinking always of you in my heart. So, he's a very advanced soul, he can do that. Maharaj? Yes? Uh, Maharaj here, Kattamuni is saying that I have now been liberated by you from my debts to my father. So, Kattamuni is telling about debts to his father? I didn't understand that, Maharaj. Well, his father had given him instructions, right? What did his father want him to do? Okay. To exp 
to matlab to get children and expand the population right right that was his dad to his father carry out the order of the father and so he he done that according to his ability he done that yes ma'am so in the purport Prabhupada talks about what is the business of the sannyasi he said one does not take sannyas freedom from family responsibilities to make another family or to create an embarrassing transcendental fraud in the name of sannyas a transcendental fraud in the name the sannyasi's business is not to become proprietor of so many things and amass money from the innocent public a sannyasi is proud that he is always thinking of krishna within himself so prabhupada describes very clearly there what is the business of the sannyasi and then he talks about different kinds of devotees there's the ghost of anandi is one kind of devotee and the other devotee here it mentions atmanandi bhajananandi or atmanandi yeah bhajananandi or atmanandi atmanandi meaning self satisfied um, other places prabhupad would say bhajananandi right satisfied by doing one's bhajan so the atmanandi or bhajananandi they don't take the they don't take up the preaching work Actually the Goswamis of Vrindavan were more bhajananandi but they wrote books they wrote books and they built temples so that was their great contribution but the Gostabanandi his job as preacher and they will have many followers for preaching the glories of the Lord and who live among these many many followers just to organize missionary activities so that's the business of the missionary activities making propaganda for the sankirtan movement like that sometimes it, of course people don't like it they criticize oh you people you make so much noise you want to you have to do everything so big this is the business of devotees yeah we want everyone to hear the holy name to get the opportunity to get krishna consciousness so prabhupad uses the word paribrajak an itinerant mendicant sanyasi should not live anywhere for more than 3 days he must be always moving because his duty is to move from door to door and enlighten people about krishna consciousness so three days prabhupad actually did that himself when he went to uh, in kenya prabhupad was staying in nairobi for some time and there's a number of hindus there in gujarat he's mostly so prabhupad would stay three days each home after three days he'd move to another home and he said in this way he said nobody will be offended he said for three days you can stay he said after three days then you should go and the indian people they respected that culture they would move out for 3 days give the house to prabhupad prabhupad would live there with his servants they stay there for 3 days after 3 days they go to another house <laughs> and the same way the people would move out and give the house to prabhupad so like that you remain detached you don't get too much attached to any one place one devotee was saying to prabhupad i just want to stay in vrindavan but prabhupad told him he said your business is to give vrindavan to others it's not just for you to enjoy you have to give vrindavan to others and it also it wasn't that prabhupad was not so happy if you're just simply moving all the time and didn't achieve anything 
he liked to see that, that there should be some achievement. If, so if by staying longer in, a, in one place, if you're able to achieve something, then it's allowed. But if you cannot achieve anything, then just move, just move. But, but they say, a rolling stone gathers no moss. You keep moving, you're not going to get, you're, you're not going to get any attachments because you keep moving. So that's the advantage of keeping moving, you don't get entangled. But at the same time, sometimes in order to do something and to develop something, you have to remain in one place and build it up and es establish it. So by staying in one place, if you're able to accomplish something, then it's allowed. So, it appears contradic contradictory because we have Kadama Muni wanting to leave home. And why does he want to leave home? The idea is to engage in the service of the Lord. But Lord Kapila has come to his home. So why does he need to leave home? Yes, someone can answer. Prabhupada said that... Uh... Right. He has to show example, the Vedic culture, to leave home. And the son has also come there. So this is not that the wife has no shelter. But the son is there to guide her, to give her protection. So Kadama Muni has done his duty as a husband. The duty is done, he can go. Right? The wife has had her children. And the children are there to take care of the wife, so there's no reason for the husband to stay any longer. Better he goes. His Holiness Mahavishnu Goswami used to say, he said, it's, it's, when you leave home, the family should say, where did he go? If the family say, when are you going, it's not good. <laughs> if you're waiting at home and one day the family say to you, when are you going to leave home? That's not good. They, when you leave home, they should say, where did he go? That's proper. And so this is the idea. Don't wait too long. Hmm. So Kadama Muni, he was a really a strict yogi. He practiced strictly as a brahmachari. And then he was a householder, he was a good householder, he did his duty as a householder. He took care of his wife, he provided everything for her, gave her all luxuries, all attention. And then they even had the child who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, he's done everything required as a husband. And now he, the, the, the Grihastha Ashram, it's, we should understand successful Grihastha life is when you move on to the next Ashram. You don't simply remain in the Grihastha Ashram. You have to move on to the next Ashram, which is the Vanaprastha. And here in this case, Kadama Muni's gone past Vanaprastha right to Sanyas. And so Prabhupada talks that in the age of Kali Yuga, sannyas is prohibited because the people are all sudras and cannot follow the rules and regulations of sannyas life. And Prabhupada writes about the bad habits of sannyasis. He said they dress themselves as sannyasis, but they cannot even follow the four principles. And so it's a nonsense. So these are some of the criticisms about sannyas. And then he says also, 
that women are not supposed to take sannyas. <laughs> so it appears to be some contradiction. Prabhupada, one quote, at one point, he quotes the injunction, no one should accept sannyas in Kali Yuga. And then he said, of course, those who, are actually, those who actually follow the rules and regulations must take sannyas. So, how to understand this? You have to take sannyas or we don't take sannyas in the Kali Yuga. What do you say? No sannyas in the Kali Yuga, right? That's the scriptural injunction. It's there in the scriptures. The Ashwamedha Gavalambam Sanyasam Palipaitrakam. There are five acts prohibited in the Kali Yuga. Yes. Five acts are prohibited. So Ashwamedha offering the horse, offering the cow, and taking sannyas, begetting a child in the womb of one's brother's wife, and offering flesh to the forefathers. So these different acts are all prohibited in the Kali Yuga. How to understand it? Are we going against the Shastra? We have sannyasis in our Krishna consciousness movement. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Maybe by the order of Guru, one can accept sannyas. Well, is it according to Shastra? Yeah, Maharaj. Somebody uh, uh, approached Prabhupada and asked uh, sannyas, and Prabhupada asked reason. Why you are uh, want you want to get uh, sannyas? And he said because I have four children, my home is like our anxiety. I don't want to be in the home. And Prabhupada said you are not well, so like uh, I don't give you sannyas. And some other two like I could not remember Maharaja's name. And Prabhupada has given him sannyas. Gorgavinda Maharaj. Gorgavinda Maharaj. Gorgovinda Maharaj also had family. And and he he, he asked Maharaj asked to Prabhupada and Prabhupada has given. Because already he was came out of the home and he was searching for the guru, spiritual master. And after uh, uh, deliberation like Prabhupada has given sannyas. Right. Yes. We see the great acharyas, the uh, Ramanujacharya took sannyas, Madhvacharya was a sannyasi, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas, right? And Gadadhar Pandit also took sannyas, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada also took sannyas. So, how to understand this? It's not against the Shastra, however, the, the, the Shastra where it says these acts are prohibited, that Shastra is actually one of the um, Tamasic Puranas or Rajasic Puranas. It's not the Sattvic Purana. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tanak Purana. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, one should, one should not be picked. Tender. One should follow the principles, uh, then he, one should be qualified as a, to, be, to take sannyas. Yes, right. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he took Kshetra sannyas and he thought Kshetra sannyas is better than uh, other, just like Savapoma Bhattacharya, he was a Kshetra sannyasi. He, he vowed to live in Jagannath Puri. And he lived there in Jagannath Puri with his wife and daughter and like that. He lived there, he, he, you know, but he lived there in a renounced manner as a Kshetra sannyasi. Kshetra sannyasi. 
And Bhaktivinoda Thakur considered that to be an appropriate form of renunciation for the Kali Yuga. However, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he took it further and he researched everything about the sannyas ashram in the other lines, in the other disciplic successions, and he introduced the Tridandi sannyas in the Gaudiya Vaishnava line. And the, of, the purpose of the sannyas, in the, as Prabhupada said, the purpose of sannyas is propagating, propaganda work. The missionary work to give Krishna consciousness to everyone. Just as Prabhupada went to America without thinking about shelter or knowing anybody there, Prabhupada went there to preach Krishna consciousness. And similarly, Lord Chaitanya went all over India. He didn't know anything, didn't know anywhere, but he went around everywhere and chanted the holy name of Krishna. <coughs> and preached, gave the, gave the message of Krishna Consciousness everywhere. Prabhupada said... Maharaj? Yes? In the purport? In the purport? Yes, so, Sannyasi is only qualified to preach Krishna Consciousness, or without taking Sannyasi, someone preaches. Is it a proper question? Uh, uh, your voice is not so clear, Prabhu. I'm sorry. Uh, Hare, Hare Krishna. Uh, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying, Maharaj, if someone picks up Krishna consciousness with utmost sincerity and devotion, without taking sannyas, is it fine or if someone is bound to be sannyas? Is it obligatory or no, every devotee to be sannyas? No, not, ob not obligatory. Not, we're not obliged to take sannyas. It's not obligatory, but the, uh, the mood of sannyas is uh, obliged. Uh, externally, you don't have to accept the sannyas ashram, but the mood should be there. Uh, the mood should be there of renunciation, de complete detachment from the world. Ultimately, we have to give up everything at some point. So sannyas is a preparation for that. But Maharaj, in Iskand, many devotees are aspiring sannyas and there is a... No, not so many. Not so many. There are a number of sannyas yeah, people. But uh, they have a very strict system now and before they give people sannyas. They have to go through a training. They have to be, have a lot of recommendation and a lot of training, a lot of preparation. We have to be examined very carefully, their track record and everything. Not such an easy thing. Actually, in ISKCON, we don't have many sannyasis. If you look at the Gaudiya Mat, the Gaudiya Mat, you see there are many sannyasis there. There's like one sannyasi to every four or five brahmacharis. But here, in ISKCON, you have hundreds of people and maybe only one sannyasi. We don't have so many sannyasis. But we need, we need more sannyasis. It's an, if we have more sannyasis, you have more preaching. More preaching work going on. That's good. It means more people coming to Krishna consciousness. However, the, uh, we have to understand that it's not for everyone. Here in the purport, text 35, Prabhupada writes, the main purpose of sannyas life is to be in constant companionship with the Supreme Lord, either by thinking of Him within the heart or hearing of Him through oral reception. And then Prabhupada said, in this age, hearing is more important than thinking, because thinking will be disturbed by the mind, the, the, uh, the agitated mind. But if we concentrate on hearing, then that will be more effective. And then Prabhupada talks about uh, loudly vibrating the Hare Krishna mantra. Then we'll be able to think of Krishna immediately. And he says the process of chanting is the best process for self-realization. 
Therefore, Lord Chaitanya preached. He preached it so nicely for the benefit of all humanity. Right? So, Lord Chaitanya took sannyas to preach the Sankirtan movement. To show everyone how to chant Hare Krishna, how to surrender to Krishna. Mm. All right, going ahead, text 36. Lord Kapila describes his appearance in the world to explain the philosophy of Sankhya, esteemed everywhere. Everyone who desires to get free from material desires, they can take to this process and become liberated souls. The path of self-realization, which is difficult to understand, has now been lost in the course of time. Please know I have assumed this form of Kapila to introduce and explain this philosophy to human society again. So this is an interesting point that the Sankhya philosophy didn't just come from Lord Kapila. It had been there before but it had been lost in the course of time. And Lord Kapila came to reintroduce it again. Just as Lord Krishna came to re-establish re religious principles by speaking Bhagavad Gita, so Lord Kapila came to re-establish the Sankhya Yoga philosophy by appearing as the son of Devahuti. So this is a problem that in course of time everything becomes lost and becomes changed. Yoga nasta parantapa, right? The Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, Krishna said, uh, Yoga nasta, the knowledge was lost in the course of time and therefore the Lord has to come to reintroduce it, to teach it again. So this is the position. Similarly with Lord Kapila. So the Lord tells Kardama Muni, now being sanctioned by me, go as you desire, surrendering all your activities to me, conquering insurmountable death, worship me for eternal life. So in this way Lord Kapila is giving permission to Kardama Muni that they can go, doesn't have to worry about anything. Uh, Prabhupada in the purport talks about the modern scientists and they don't understand what the goal of life is. They can never understand about being victorious over birth and death. They're, they're, the modern scientists are only thinking about how to give comfort to the material body, how to make the body comfortable, but they can never solve the real problems of life. So this is the ignorance of the material world. Because of ignorance, we engage in sinful activities. And the sinful activities cause us to suffer in the material world, keep us entangled and take another birth in the material world. But if we learn the Sankhya philosophy, if we get actual knowledge, then we can get free from all of this ignorance and we can get out of the entanglement of the material world. So this is the mercy of Kardama Muni. We want to get out of the material world. And Lord Kapila benedicts Kardama Muni. He tells him, you will always see me Dwell, the super soul dwelling within the heart of all living entities. Thus you will achieve the state of eternal life, free from all lamentation and fear. Prabhupada writes, seeing, simply by seeing the form of the Lord as he presents himself by his own internal potency as Krishna or Rama or Kapila, then one can directly see the Brahma Jyoti. Brahma Jyoti 
people think seeing the Brahma Jyoti is the goal. But if you see the Lord, if you see Lord Kapila or Lord Krishna or Lord Rama, then everything is there. The Paramatma is there, the Brahman is there. It's all included within the form of the Supreme Lord. And Lord Kapila tells Kadama Muni that I'm going to give this knowledge to my mother so that she can also become perfect and she can get free of this material world. That she will also be freed from all material fear. So the husband goes off to take sannyas and the son is at home and he's taking care of the mother. He's going to deliver the mother. And Prabhupada asks, what is the position of a woman who is left by her husband? And so she is entrusted to the son. As the son promises, deliver his mother. Women are not supposed to take sannyas. The husband leaves home, the wife should feel happy that her husband is advanced, that he's able to leave home. That's a, a good sign. The husband stays at home ever, forever, it's not very good. The ideal son Kapila Muni is assuring his father of the deliverance of his mother so that his father may go peacefully without anxiety for his good wife. So you can. Yeah. Yes. yes. Maharaj, if suppose like for the children, uh, if they are not a devotees, so in that condition, like the uh, women's or still have to be with the uh, children's or they can take shelter of any dams with the devotees. Yes, of course. If the children are not devotees, then you can always take shelter of the dam. You know, there are things like widows' ashrams. Sometimes we see these things in the Holy Dham. There are widows' ashrams where the widows will stay so they can leave their body in the Holy Dham. We do have elderly ladies come to leave their body here in Mayapur and sometimes in Vrindavan also. But women also get old, not just men. So the Holy Dham is not just for, for men. Ladies also can come and prepare to leave the world. They can also come and do some humble service. If the family are not devotees, if it's not convenient to go and stay with the son, then yeah, you take shelter of the Krishna consciousness movement. Your spiritual master can direct you and he can help to arrange and give you, give you an introduction to some suitable place. Yeah? Ah, of course, some ladies have no son, they have no, no opportunity, maybe they, some ladies never marry like that, so they, they also have a place in Krishna consciousness. Not every woman is able to take shelter of her child, but a spiritual teacher is there, he's like a father, and he can arrange for the welfare of the wife, of, the, of the, the woman, so that she can also prepare for leaving the body. So this is described, text 41, Prabhupada talks about going to the forest is compulsory for everyone. It is not a mental excursion upon which one person goes and another does not. Everyone should go to the forest, at least as a vanaprastha. Forest going means to take 100% shelter of the Supreme Lord. And then Prabhupada quotes Prahlad Maharaj, Samadvadut, like that Prahlad Maharaj told his father, better you go to the forest, right? Because he knew his father was the griha anda kupam. He was like an animal fallen in a well. So he told his father, you, you have to go to the forest, your only hope. 
go to the forest. Of course, his father didn't appreciate that, being the materialist which he was. He preferred the griha and the kupam. Hmm. It's described in text 42, it's described Kardama made a vow of silence to, so that he could think of the personality of Godhead and take shelter of him. In this way he was travelling, taking a vow of silence. In Prabhupada in the purport he talks about how a devotee is also a vow of silence by only chanting Hare Krishna and only speaking about Krishna. That is silence for the devotee. So sannyasis can also have the vow of silence. Just speak about Krishna, just chant Hare Krishna. Don't have to say anything else. Prabhupada says he does not have to cook or offer fire for sacrifice because he's always engaged in Krishna consciousness. Therefore he has already accomplished all ritualistic performances. He should not have his own house but should depend completely on the Supreme Lord for his food and lodging. He should travel. Unless one becomes silent, he cannot think completely about the pastimes and activities of the Lord. It certainly helps to be uh, silent, not to speak, but of course we have to be careful to control the mind, to keep the mind fixed on Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada quotes Chanakya Pandit, he said, A rascal appears very intelligent as long as he does not speak, but speaking is the test, the so-called silence of a silent impersonalist indicate that he has nothing to say, <laughs> he simply wants to beg. So Prabhupada didn't appreciate these kind of people who do monavrat. Prabhupada said, Mona necessitates re refraining from nonsense talking and engaging the talking facility in the pastimes of the Lord. In that way one can chant and hear to perfect his life. And ahimsa means not being violent. And there are 18 processes for attaining knowledge and perfection and Kardama Muni adopted all these principles for self-realization. So Bhagavad Gita describes these different items of knowledge. Ahin, uh, uh, Adam, how does it go? Uh, Adam, uh, oh. humility, <laughs> humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, austerity, like that. Yes. Humility, pridelessness, austerity, nonviolence, these things. Eighteen items are mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. So to fix his mind on Krishna in this way, he's able to conquer over the modes of nature and he's able to fully absorb himself in thought of the Parabrahman. Thus he gradually, gradually became unaffected by the false ego of material identity, became free from material affection, undisturbed, equal to everyone, and without duality he could indeed see himself. His mind was turned inward, was perfectly calm, like an ocean agitated by the waves. Prabhupada writes in the purport, he does not look outside to material nature, but he looks in to the spiritual nature of his existence. With a sober mind, he simply engages 
in the service of the Lord. Thus he realizes his own self without false identification with matter and without affection for material possessions. So this is actual detachment. No material possessions, giving up material possessions. Of course, we do need things for the service of Krishna, but sometimes, you know, Krishna takes these things away from us. We have to be careful. Try to use what we have in the service of Krishna. Take care of it. Prabhupada, for example, he had his books, his San Sanskrit books. They were important for him. And then dictaphone for translation. Those were the main things. All right, so this way, this Kadama Muni is able to see the Supreme Lord everywhere, in everyone's heart, and he's ready to go back to Godhead. So that's described there. Text 47, the final text, freed from all hatred and desire, Kadama Muni equal to everyone, discharging uncondam uncontaminated devotional service, ultimately attained the path back to Godhead. So he achieved the goal to go back to Godhead, Kardama Muni. In uh, Kapila Shiksha, it's described that Devahuti, she went to Kapila Vaikuntha. We don't actually, we're not told just where Kadama Muni is going, what's his destination. But certainly it would be Vaikuntha, some Vaikuntha planet, and quite likely it could also be Vai Kapila Vaikuntha. Okay, are there any questions, any comments on this? Maharaj, actually, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, one is that now, according to the scriptural instruction, we are not obligatory, the devotees are not obligatory to take them. Huh? What? I can't hear what you're saying, Prabhu. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Maharaj, yes, now it is clear? My... Yes, if you speak clearly, I'll hear. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Maharaj, now I'm, I'm, yes, it is fine. So what I'm saying, from these scriptural instructions, we learn that it is not obligatory on part of the Greek devotee to take sannyas, but it is obligatory to take panapurast. Am I correct? Yes. Right, it's, oblig it's obligatory for the higher castes to take vanaprast. Higher caste means Vaishya, Kshatriya, uh, Brahmins, they should take vanaprast. Pancha Sorvam Vanambrajit, they should move into the vanaprasta ashram. From, it said from the age of 50 and Prabhupada said sometimes earlier, sometimes later. Sometimes it would be later, you know, depending on everybody's situation. But you have to arrange for that, that you can enter into the retired ashram. Retired means retired from material responsibilities, to take up spiritual responsibilities. There's no retirement from the spiritual duties. The retirement is from the material duties, the family affairs. Now, Vanaprastas, their duty is to engage more fully in spiritual practice. They could stay in their own home. They don't have to leave the home. A wife also can be there. It's not required. They have to separate. They can be together. They can be in their own home. Or they can go to live in the holy places. And they can go to travel to holy places. Either way. But in the home... The husband's duty is spiritual practice. He will worship the deities, he will study the scriptures, he will chant the holy name. He won't be worrying about money and he won't be much concerned with the family affairs. So it is fine, Maharaj, but 
uh, in Prabhupada's past times, so what it is evident from his past times, that he, okay, he was a good YouTube lord, but he didn't uh, adopt his uh, Banapur directly to Padnas. No, Prabhupada took Sant Prabhupada accepted Vanapras. The okay. said, Huh? Prabhupada was Vanaprastha for quite a lot, quite a while. He was a Vanaprastha, first of all, he was living at home, then later on he went to live in Vrindavan as Vanaprastha. He was living okay. in the Godiamat temples. He was doing editing work there for different devote, different god brothers. He was working there in Vrindavan, sometimes in Delhi, sometimes in Vrindavan, working for different temples, doing editorial work for some newspaper one of the god brothers was publishing. Okay. So thank you, Maharaj. My second question is what is the technical difference between Sancho philosophy enacted by Kapil God? Lord Kapila and uh, Imposter Kapila. Uh, it's not clear, Prabhu. What are you saying? A Kapila and what? Imposter, imposter Kapila. What is that? So, imposter, not imposter, but the impersonalist Kapila. He was okay. an impersonalist. He was not the son. He's, an, he's, he's also Kapila, but he's not the son of Devahuti. He's not the son of Devahuti in Kardama. He appeared much later than Devahuti in Kardama's Kapila. So it was much later, this other, the impersonalist or the atheistic Kapila came. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. So the atheist Kapila, he preaches the atheistic Sankhya philosophy. The atheistic Sankhya philosophy does not speak about life coming from the soul or God. It preaches that life comes from matter. They say life comes from matter, that the chemicals themselves are the cause of life. They don't recognize the spiritual particle. They don't recognize the existence of God. This is the atheistic Kapila philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, no, uh, no more questions tonight. So we'll finish. Same, uh, same question. Do you have any questions? No, no. If a uh, same question will probably satisfy, there's no more questions. Okay, so thank you all very much for association. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for your association. Maharaj, few of the devotee wants to share their realizations and experience with you. May I allow them? Yeah, okay. For a few minutes. Shama Gopika Mata Ji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving this uh, fortunate to associate with and hear Bhagavatam from you. Uh, Bhagavatam itself, it's so much glorification and uh, hearing from pure devotees like you, it really is our fortunate. And uh, the way that you took us the class, like um, some examples, like practical examples and how to be practically and uh, related to some scriptures, like um, other examples in the scriptures related to the point what we are reading. So it really uh, makes us to meditate on many past times in Bhagavatam. So we are uh, really, really so fortunate. And uh, I heard like um, 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 Jai Pram Maharaj is loved by everyone in Mayapur, but I see that from your explanation, most of the time you give example of Maharaj, like so, I really relish that as well. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Govinda Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. So, my mic is somewhere there. But you let you, yes. My, my humble obeisance is to Maharaj. I told you what is present here. The class was very interesting. I enjoyed the class very much. Because Maharaj's explanation was very practical and pragmatic. 
in all approaches she was giving enormous examples by illuminating our our concentration of those particular subject matters and maharaj was immediately asking question in relation to particular subject matter he was asking question and he was collecting information through our answers with regard to the subject it was very interactive it was well organized so i have i have a nervous deep respect from the core of my heart that maharaj if if such associations of maharaj would be otherwise available in in ancient days that would be rather very much enthusiastic and beneficial in so far as the spiritual advancement is concerned so so i am i am deeply i am deeply i am obliged to maharaj for his so much fantastic and excellent lectures Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Prabhu, for your very kind words. Thank you so much for your participation. Samita Mata Ji. Samita Mata Ji is not there. Pass over, Prabhu. Yes, sir. Um, Nandu Pranam Maharaj. Um, I have been very fortunate to have your association since 1996. that uh, in the year 1996 uh, we were in brajamundra uh, parikrama and you were also there and uh, i got the assistance of you i remember once uh, some maharaj asked one question from sri bhagavatam do you answer that question that it is sri bhagavatam fifth chapter fifth chapter text 5 like that you have answered that question and in 2017 again i had the opportunity to have your assistance in, uh, in bhakti shastri uh, you have uh, taught us in bhakti shastri also and uh, now again we are third time fortunate that uh, i have been the, got the your association and uh, it is a very <coughs> nice experience that you have mentioned about prabhupad maharaj your first and experience should be say so it is like uh, just like you we are also uh, associated with prabhupad to you and uh, we are uh, learning bhagavatam you are also a personal in bhagavatam It is said that Jao Bhagavata Pada Vaishnavaro Stane, and there are two types of Bhagavata. One is Brahma Bhagavata, and another is Bhakta Bhagavata. So we are uh, learning the Brahma Bhagavata from Bhakta Bhagavata like you. So we are very much fortunate, and I express my deep uh, uh, indebtedness and also uh, my, um, so to say, my obligation to you uh, for your kind uh, uh, this lecture. and i offer my obeisances to maradana prana hari krishna thank you so much prabhu for your very kind words thank you for your association over so many years <laughs> i have been very fortunate tamita mata ji thank you krishna maharaj please accept my obeisances also hari krishna uh, so as it is said in the shrimad bhagavatam uh, sadhu sambhashte ka ंगली and you also made us into so many group discussion so that we uh, contemplate on every line of bhagavatam and we uh, you made a, like how for example you told us to think how the lord reciprocates to our prayers like that you made us to do group discussions and you explained everything so nice thank you very much maharaj for giving us your association and uh, maharaj uh, if it is okay uh, can you please share your email id so that uh, we can invite you for uh, 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 programs online group is coming there or children preaching yeah where are you is tamil road maharaj uh, india maharashtra mira road in vrindavan mumbai mumbai mira road oh bombay bombay mira road oh, no. yes maharaj okay if i come there i'll meet you i don't know <laughs> I'm not traveling just now. I should be traveling at the Sanyasi, but somehow with the pandemic, I haven't been traveling. I travel on the internet regularly. Yes, Maharaj, we can 
Yes, Maharaj, we will be fortunate if you can come online for us and give us your association. I can come online for your association, yes. You invite Thank me. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Can you please share your email ID if it is okay? Yes, yes. Prabhu has it, right? You have my email ID. I will share in WhatsApp group. Okay. Anybody Thank you, Maharaj. Apurva Lechandra Shwari Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Sanam. So we are very fortunate that we got your association for two units, and it was very uh, nice that we got your association and how patiently and humbly you answer all our questions, <laughs> and uh, like uh, you always give time to ask answer for our questions and. Like, make the class very interactive. We all we are very fortunate to have your association, and also, like, I just want to say thank you very much for <laughs> solving our doubts and everything. Hare Krishna, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> I'm not a great scholar, but I learn more by being with all your students. You're the you're my teachers, and I learn from all of you by your association. So. Thank you so much. We learn more, <laughs> like we got, we also get to purify by uh, being in your situation and hear from you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Same question, Prabhu. Yeah. I want to ask forgiveness if I disturb any time in the class. And also I wanted to thank you, Maharaj. You have a wonderful quality of humility, which is so nice, Maharaj, to get your association and we need a lot of your blessings to be, uh, to just progress towards as you are. So, Maharaj, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> thank you very much for your kind words. Siddhartha, Hare Krishna, I um, just got a few notes down, um, what I'd like to share. So I think the one thing is definite is you always came on time, Lord, without fail. You're so consistent with coming on time and many times before many of us you've been doing. So it's very embarrassing, but thank you for really leading by example in this way. Um, yeah, I feel one of the things as many devotees have shared is that the your qualities, you know, you're very humble, even as a sinati, you know, it's very weird to see you know, someone in such an elevated position, being so humble, tolerant, and patient with us. And I think not even once during this whole class, the, the, this whole two units, you've lost your cool. You know, you're always so patient, calm, and uh, yeah, your qualities are very uh, inspiring to ascribe for. And the third thing I want to say is, uh, thank you so much for the group discussions. I can definitely say that we've had the most group discussions with you. <laughs> It almost felt like, uh, yeah, doing it in doing it in person because yeah, when you're in person, you can break out into groups, you can have a reflection discussion. So really, we get to use our high order skills rather than just you know sitting and just listening to you. So I think I really appreciate uh, you putting us into many groups and allowing us to discuss and then present as well. That's also a nice opportunity. So thank you much, sincerely. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for accepting me as your as a a guide as a, a sort of teacher. <laughs> as I said, you're you're my teachers. So I get inspired by all of your questions. It helps me to think more deeply about the the, the philosophy. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept our humble obeisance, Maharaj. Uh, uh, what we like to speak, most of our uh, devotees already explained, but still I will repeat the same thing because the, with the qualities which I was inspired, like your humility, and Maharaj trying to ask some questions so that the students would uh, whether understand or not. So if somebody is like, like some, many times I answer to Maharaj asking again a question, again a again. So, to that strengthen our understanding more and depend into the uh, philosophical truth. So, Maharaj, I like the, the type of teaching and uh, engaging us in the group discussions. And moreover, uh, the, the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam should be read from the, the 
person Bhagavad. So we are very fortunate and we are very grateful at your lotus feet to have this uh, two minutes. So Maharaj, uh, I am expecting in the future your more association. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your kind words, Prabhu. Thank you for your participation. Then make sure Maharaj will be our teacher in Bhakti Vaibhava too. Oh, Hare Krishna, Hare Bo. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Hare Bo. Hare Bo. Hare Bo. So, so Chitra Mataji wants to add something. So, so Chitra, so Chitra Mataji wants to add something. I think everybody said Krishna. enough. Hare Krishna Maharaj, everybody from Akhita Mahamudu Center. Maharaj, first uh, I met uh, in, uh, after initiation in uh, 2015. I took the association of Maharaj in Mayapur, Rajapur Temple. So at that time, Maharaj was uh, giving question answer session. So at that time, I took the association of Maharaj, but uh, I I thought the uh, Maharaj is giving nice lecture and uh, nice explanations of uh, any any person is co um, ask, asking the questions. Maharaj giving the perfect answers with nice explanations. So I thought uh, uh, when when I will talk uh, association of Maharaj and uh, when uh, I take part of in question answers also. So I was thinking in future, but in Bhakti Bhava class, I fulfilled that Krishna desire, Krishna fulfilled my desire. Uh, so I am very fortunate to uh, take the association of Maharaj and uh, in group discussions also. Uh, I am very fortunate, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mariji. Very kind of you. Aditya Lata Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All blessed to Shri Prabhupada. Thank you very much for your association. Your classes were wonderful. And uh, one very special thing about this is you are giving example of Prabhupada. And as we know that um, that you have, uh, you got so much um, association of Prabhupada. You are giving uh, all live examples what you actually experienced with him. I used to feel that, oh, Prabhupada is actually saying this, you know, sitting in front of us. That is, that is one of the unique experience I had with you. Also, um, you were actually giving us a lot of opportunity to ask questions and you were patient with us. I know some of my questions were very, sounded very naive, but still you, you know, tolerated and explained beautifully just to make sure that I understood it properly. And I really thank you for your association and hope in future also I get your association. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for your kind words. Chaitanya Vishnu Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, 